Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, so for those of you who haven't been to one of these before, this is the Matwani Theory Colloquium, uh, named in honor of our late colleague Rajiv Matwani. And so generally we have these roughly once a quarter. Um, and the, we do invite speakers you know, to, to speak on topics that are theoretical in nature, but uh, you know, we tend to get uh, very well-known speakers and also you know, we try to find people who are known to be excellent speakers. Uh, who also to talk on topics that are hopefully of, of broad appeal. And so our first one for this academic school year, I'm very uh, pleased to introduce Ravi Kanan. Uh, so Ravi got his uh, PhD from Cornell, something he and I have in common. Right. Uh, he was a professor at Yale, uh, at CMU for many years, uh, then also a professor at Yale. These days he's at Microsoft Research, often based in Asia, but these days we're lucky enough to have him spending significant time in the Bay Area, so we grabbed him from one of these colloquia. Um, you know, as someone with his track record, uh, it befits he's gotten a couple of really major awards. For example, uh, the Fulkerson Prize back in 1991 for his work on polynomial time computation or approximation of the volume of convex bodies. He also won the Knuth Prize in 2011. That's sort of a uh, you know lifetime uh, award for theoretical computer science. Uh, and so again, uh, please welcome Robbie Khan. So thank you, Tim. Thanks for the invitation, and let's see if I meet some of the requirements he set out in the talk, but we'll, we'll see. The talk is um, sort of theory meets practice in a way. Uh, a topic modeling, which uh, I will introduce because uh, there are theory people in the audience who, like me, may not have known about it till a year ago, I, I just found out. Uh, but the other uh, stuff, singular value decomposition, probably many of you have heard of. But I'll try to do this, uh, the two sides, both from first principles, so that it's clear. Forget the date, it was the day it was written. Uh, I'm going to start not with topic modeling, but with thresholding. Thresholding is just as a simple device of saying every entry in a matrix above a particular value is 1, set it to 1, every entry below set it to 0. That's all I mean by thresholding. This simple thing I'll demonstrate in a sort of toy setup first, that it helps. And then we'll use this as one of the tools in the topic modeling. So let's say you have an n by n matrix. And there's a subset of k, cardinality k out of the n. I've drawn it here like this. So this is, um, you, uh, so the aij's are independent random variables, all of them uh, mutually independent. But for uh, things in the i and j belonging to the set s, in this picture, for clarity, I put S up here, but S is unknown. You're given the matrix in some arbitrary order. I don't know where S is, but I put it up there, permuted things so that I put it up there. And um, uh, let's call the, pro the probability of AIJ is greater than or equal to mu is at least a half for this part. So think of it perhaps as a bias normal with mean mu. Doesn't have to be, it's a more general distribution. But with probability half, it's at least mu. Mu is positive. Think of mu as a signal, and uh, the rest is just the rest is just uh, uh, noise, right? Normal zero sigma squared. This is Gaussian independent entries, mean zero, variance sigma, variance sigma squared, right? And your job is to find S. I give you the matrix A, and I tell you mu and sigma for this toy problem. And of course, in in not toy versions, you're not told mu and sigma, but right now. You're told mu and sigma, and your job is to find the subset S, right? Which, as I said, it's not permitted to be up on top in general. So some of you have heard of, at least in the TCS community, it's a common problem, uh, the so-called planted clique problem. And that's roughly when you make all these entries 1, and these entries plus or minus 1, uniformly at random. Okay? But this is slightly different. Uh, you have Gaussians here and, uh, and uh, an arbitrary distribution with probability at least mu, at least a half, right? So here is uh, what you might do. So you call this a signal to noise ratio suggestively, mu over sigma. Um, the standard uh, planted clique problem is sort of like this, where the signal to noise ratio, if you will, is one. Mu and sigma are one in that case, right? Uh, there are known results that say for the planted clique, I'm recasting them in this, uh, in this sort of definition. If the signal to noise ratio, it better be at least root n over k, then we can find s. That's the same as saying k must be at least root n. That's the best we know, 
we don't know how to find planted cliques of size less than k. Another way of saying it in this case is the signal to noise ratio is below this. We don't know. It's not proven that we cannot do it, but we don't know how to do it. Okay. Now, it's proved. Here's a recent result. We do know that so-called statistical learning algorithms cannot do this if the signal to noise ratio goes below that. I won't define them, but it turns out many known algorithms will go under this uh, in, or in this category. I was recently proved that those algorithms will not do it. Okay. Now, here is uh, uh, in this toy setup, in this simple setup, I'm going to show you how thresholding has quite a large advantage. So I'll call this a uh, brave new step. It's not really brave or new. But you, let's threshold all the entries of the given matrix A at mu. So below mu 0, above mu 1. Okay? So B is this matrix. Now, in expectation, the probability that these entries are set to 1 will be at least a half, because it's probability half they are greater than mu. What about the probability that one of these entries is set to 1? Well, they are normal 0 sigma squared. This is just a, a normal density. That's a constant I missed there. But this is just a normal density, right? So the probability is exponentially going down with mu over sigma. Okay? Uh, we have to subtract this to center the matrix. Uh, I, I'm going to use random matrix theory for that. The mean has to be 0. Ignore this. This is just a technical step. Once I do the subtraction, here's what happens. This part has spectral norm, that is spectral norm, largest singular value, at least k over 4. Because you can take 1 over root k, 1 over root k here. Okay? So it, it doesn't matter what the bounds are. It has high spectral norm, that part. What about this part, that is this part, or the rest of the matrix? Now, that's a random matrix with mean 0 once I've done the subtraction. So random matrix theory tells you that the largest singular value is root in times uh, this quantity here. Uh, this C is actually one fourth. You have to do a little bit of a calculation, but it comes from this. Uh, the, these entries are zero, one also, but with variance about this. So the variance is what comes into the pro random matrix theory bound. Again, not important to understand exactly the remember exactly the bound, but the point is this. Now, if I do SVD, now if I do singular value decomposition, I succeed as long as this is smaller than that. But this is exponential. If you work that out, that is saying exponential function e to the c times mu over sigma squared has to be greater than root n over k. Compare that with what we said in the last slide. Ordinary SVD works provided the signal to noise ratio is root n over k. This threshold that SVD works provided e to the signal to noise ratio is greater than that, right? So you get an exponential advantage out of this, this very simple device of thresholding. Okay? So this is outside statistical learning algorithms? Uh, it is outside statistical learning. In fact, uh, I didn't put this on the slide. I, I think I now have a proof that something you cannot do by statistical learning, but you can do after thresholding. Okay. But this, this, is, this is not statistical, because you have to get the whole vector. That's the difference. Okay. So thresholding can buy you something. Now, there's one other thing it can buy you, and I want to remark on this before I launch into topic modeling. Um, so suppose you have data points, n data points. Each data point has d features. So it's a d-dimensional vector. It's an RD. That's the standard setup, right? Now, really, uh, topic modeling is just soft clustering, and uh, we'll see that a couple of times just to rub that in. Um, so data points for this uh, toy, this is still a toy setup. Let's say there are two, only two soft clusters. Data point J belongs, uh, let's say WJ is half, that says belongs half to cluster 1 and half to cluster 2. More generally, it could belong 1 third to cluster 1 and 2 thirds to cluster 2. So there's a weighted membership in each cluster. That's a soft clustering, right? Hard clustering would say each data point belongs exactly to this cluster or to this cluster. So the weight is 0 or 1. Soft clustering is when it belongs half here, half there, or one third here, two thirds there, right? And now, uh, suppose AIJ. So suppose there is a notion of dominant feature. We'll introduce this. Okay. So uh, each uh, data point has some dominant features, and in the dominant features, it's high. Uh, in a moment, I'll tell you why dominant features are natural. But pretend that each data point has some dominant features, and in the dominant features, it's high. 
forget the word dominant topic for the moment. In the non-dominant features, it's low, lower than sigma. That's your old standard deviation, right? Now, let's think of, so I would like to cluster this into the two clusters. That's a little more difficult to imagine how you cluster, because it's not hard clustering, but pretend we can do that. But here is another problem. So suppose in the dominant features, which could lie anywhere from mu to 1, okay, but the variance might be very large. Mu might be 0 0.3, 0 0.3 to 1, it's a 0 0.7 range. The variance might be very large. Might be, in fact, much larger than the gap between mu and sigma. So let's say mu is 0 0.3, sigma is 0 0.2. Sigma is a non-dominant, it should be less, it's 0.2. The gap is 0.1, but the spread of the dominant feature could be all the way from 0.3 to 1, right? Now, if you were to two cluster, if you were to split into two clusters, uh, let's say you use two, two means algorithm, two means algorithm will say, will split the larger cluster because it's too broad, right? So, uh, again, when I want a two cluster, the intended clusters should have small spread inside compared to the gap, right? If the spread inside is more than the gap, you're in trouble because you'd split one of the clusters, right? So that's unfortunate. Okay. Uh, it, now, the, the remark I want to make is it's different from hard clustering or mixtures and so on uh, because you could have high variance in the dominant features, right? How does thresholding help? Suppose magically somebody told me mu, and I thresholded mu, now the variance goes away. So everybody above mu is set to 1, so all the dominant features are set to 1, zero variance. All the non-dominant features, hopefully most of the non-dominant features are set to 0. So this is a way to reduce the variance among dominant features, right? So that, it in fact, is going to happen in the topic modeling case, that there will be dominant features and they have very large spread. Yeah. I guess maybe it's more relevant in the previous setting, but um, you know, if you have your, you know, if your submatrix has elements with mean mu, but then picked according to a Gaussian, then the thresholding, uh, does it still help? Yeah, it, it, it still helps. But not exponentially? No, it helps exponentially. You have to, okay, so the optimal threshold is 2 mu, not mu, it turns out. Uh, there, are, there are a few tricks, but... But, okay, so okay. I, I, okay. Okay. we'll, we'll yeah. go over that in detail, yeah. Okay, okay now we come to the uh, sort of the main uh, bulk of the paper in some sense. This topic is joint work with uh, Bansal and Bhattacharya. This is in uh, the upcoming NIPS, or next week's NIPS, I think. Uh, the problem is the following, the topic modeling problem. I mean, many of you or all of you are familiar with it, perhaps bear with me. I'll do a one page, one, one or two slide introduction are related to soft clustering. There are d features of each vector. Each, each, each document is a vector. Okay, each document is a d vector. And the document, um, and there are k topics. k is to be, k is much smaller than d. d, you know, the number of words in the dictionary might be 20,000, k is 50 or 100. Uh, each topic is also a d vector. And d, d has components which sum to one, non-negative components which sum to one. You can think of them as a probability of each word in that topic. Okay. Now, ideally, I should do this, but it's, I'm too lazy to do that, which is, you know, draw a picture. You all, I mean, you see, presumably, you know, you can imagine the picture. But, uh, so anyway, so uh, uh, this is a stochastic model. So documents are being generated stochastically, right? So um, you generate words of a document. The, the document has maybe 200 words that you generate in a document or whatever. Uh, in IID trials, and each trial you generate from a multinomial distribution, but the probabilities, it's not a pure, each document is not on one topic, it's on a combination of topics. So if you're talking about news articles, that, as in this example, a document may be one third on sports, one third on weather, one third on politics. So you take one third, one third, one third combination of those three vectors and generate from that probability distribution. Now, if this is not going to be clear in one slide, I'll draw a picture, and I hope that makes it clearer. The topic modeling problem is the model fitting problem. I'm given documents. I'm given document vectors arranged as columns of a matrix A, let's say. A is a matrix. Each column is a document. And uh, you want to find an approximation 
to the generating uh, data, which is uh, the document, the topic vectors, the topic vectors there, right? You want to find the topic vectors. Now, more precisely, you want them with L1 error at most a given epsilon. It's critical it's L1 error because these are probability vectors. Um, it turns out it requires a little bit of sweat to get L1 error because there are other results which get you other things like L2 error, which are not quite as good because uh, they can ignore small words. We want L1 error. So you mean crucial to be meaningful? That's what you mean? L1, error. Uh, L1 error is crucial to be meaningful because... Technically more challenging. Technically more challenging and crucial to be meaningful because I can tell you why. Because if there are 20,000 words, many of them have probability, let's say, at most 1 over 40,000, right? If I pick 200 words, I never see them. But if I'm worried about only L2 error, I could have set all those components to zero. I'm all right because I square and sum. Okay? But L1 error, I'm not all right. So I, I, if, and in fact, in the example, in, in real corpora, a lot of the frequencies, a lot of the spectrum is occupied by small words. And so you cannot throw away all small words, which is what L2 error would do. So that's why we need to control L1 error. Okay, it's generally NP-hard, uh, even with a lot of restrictions, so we want to do it approximately, obviously, right? Now, I, I want to relate it to something which is more familiar and draw a picture because then uh, hopefully it'll make it clear. It's really just soft clustering. The topic vectors are just the cluster centers. Each data point belongs to a weighted combination of clusters, right? Weighted combination of topic, one-third sports, one-third weather, one-third politics. Uh, and you generate from a distribution which in the topic modeling case happens to be multinomial, but more generally it's just the expectation is the weighted combination of the cluster centers, right? So even if we manage to solve the clustering problem, whatever that means, it's not true that cluster centers are averages of documents, right? Uh, and I, again, I'll draw a picture. So that's a big distinction from hard clustering or learning mixture. So here's a picture. Hopefully that'll explain a lot. So um, the corners are the topic vectors, mu1, mu2, mu3. In this case, there are three topic vectors, which are the corners of the simplex, right? Um, the x's. Each x corresponds to one document. In this case, I'm generating one, two, three, four, five, six documents, okay, which are the crosses. The crosses are convex combination of the corners, so they lie inside the simplex. Now, I, to generate a document, uh, to generate words of a document, circles of words, okay, so here are, f I'm generating five words from each document. Here are the five words in that document, okay which are generated, their expectation is the cross, but they can lie outside the simplex. Okay? They don't have to be in the simplex, right? What I'm given is the circles. What I'm given is the circle vectors, right? And I'm to find the corners of the simplex. Okay? So even if I sort of split it up into this part, this part, and this part, I'm still not done because I really need the corners. Okay? That's a topic modeling problem. Given the circles, get me the corners. Finding the corners, do you necessarily find the x's too? No, actually the x's are not possible to find. The weight vectors and the x's are not possible to find, but you can find the corners approximately. So you know the topics for each document? No, no, no. You, you are not given... would be though, identifying what the topic characteristics are. Right, so in general that's not possible, right? So it's computationally not possible. But I'm going to make assumptions which I'll come to so that we make it possible. So everything, everybody has to make, they are NP-hard problems, so everybody has to make assumptions. But we have to make them reasonable. Sure. Yeah. So the, the input is, is coming from some distribution. Right. right. So the problem, is there some trade-off between like the number of circles you put on the picture versus the time it takes to come up? Sure. With so the sample complexity is important. So there is a, basically an information theoretical lower bound on the sample complexity, and the, our algorithm will meet that within constants and log factors. But yes, so you can't do it if you have too few circles. Yeah. I mean, you clearly need at least as many circles as a number of dictionary words, otherwise you can convince yourself. Yeah. So that's the problem, okay? This triangle is the problem. Uh, prior results and assumptions, right? Uh, Okay, so there's something called a pure topics assumption. Pure topics means every document is only on one topic, only on weather, only on sports, right? Under that assumption, plus another assumption, which is called primary words, which is one plus epsilon 
uh, frequency of the words or primary for each topic. So if it's weather, there are words exclusive to the topic weather which occupy 1 minus epsilon of the total relative frequency. That's an assumption. It's a fairly strong assumption, right? So under those assumptions, an early paper uh, of Papadimitri Raghav and Tamaki and Vampala showed that singular value decomposition does the job. Okay. Then uh, there was sort of a belief, if you will, that SVD cannot solve the non-pure topic case. It's clear how to give ex some examples where non-pure topics means SVD fails, but that was a belief, right? Um, then uh, we had a very um, important paper which proposed a particular distribution, particular distribution for the stochastic model, particular distribution of weights on the topics. So to generate a topic, how do you choose their random variables? How do you choose the random variables with your weights on the topics? And that's, uh, uh, they proposed, Blyning and Jordan proposed uh, latent Dirichlet allocation. I won't describe the distribution. It's a probability distribution. And it's a really popular model. Uh, this is non-pure. Multiple topics are allowed. So topic weights, uh, it turns out LDA gives you topic weights that are sort of uncorrelated. That is, I take a document, if I put a certain weight on weather, a certain weight on sports, basically they're uncorrelated. And this is a problem, and there are, there are other papers and extensions, for instance, by Bly and Lefferty and others, which build in correlations with more complicated models. But the difficulty is that, before I go there, but the difficulty is that uh, LDA basically, in general, computationally intractable even to find the posterior probability. So I give you a bunch of possible models, which is the best? That computation is itself NP-hard. That's a posterior probability. So it's, it's a hard problem. And then when you build in correlations, it becomes even harder um, to do it exactly. But now uh, this paper, Anand Kumar et al., uh, were able to do topic modeling for LDA, but under L2 error. It turns out it's a very nice tensor methods, but they only accomplish L2 error. It is an important open question, for instance, to do LDA under L1 error. We don't know how to do that, right? And L2 has this issue that we discussed a little earlier. Okay. Now, uh, in addition to assuming LDA, they have to assume uh, a bunch of numerical parameters like conditions number, condition numbers, and that's another thing we'll come to. And then there's a paper of Aurora, Ga, and Moistra, uh, which is in a sense the first paper that gave a provable result. It preceded that paper. Um, but they assume something called an anchor word assumption, now, I, what that is, it is written here in a minute, but also other parameters. What is an anchor word? They assume that each topic is one word that occurs exclusively in that topic and occurs with high frequency. So let me illustrate that by just an example. So for instance, the topic sports, you might assume the word batter is exclusive to it. That might be true. It may not appear in the other things, but it's a strong assumption to say that it never occurs in topic politics. But even stronger is the assumption that it occurs with very high frequencies. For instance, every 20th word in that, on that topic is the word batter. Is that particular word batter, right? That's the assumption of an anchor word. Single word, which is very high frequency. Then, but they give the first probable algorithm, uh, uh, which is, um, involves a fair bit of sweat. It's fairly complicated. Our aim is to try to give an intuitive, empirically verified assumption. So we want to give assumptions that uh, have some empirical justification to them, but are also intuitively uh, simple or simple to understand at least, and give a natural algorithm under those assumptions. That's what we will accomplish, right? Uh, so uh, the assumptions first, and then a brief sketch of the algorithm, and then I'll give you, uh, uh, which, you know, this is something that I haven't done before in other talks, but there are empirical results, uh, which also I will present at the, end, uh, at the end of the talk, right? As befits the NIFT paper. So, uh, the assumptions, we want the assumptions to be intuitive to topic modeling, uh, not numerical, uh, perhaps, like condition numbers, which are good, but they don't relate to the particular context, right? So here's one assumption, catchwords. So this is, um, uh, I was trying to get up an alternative to keywords or anchor words, which were all being taken already, right? So I came up with catchwords, but here is what a catchword is, right? A catchword is each topic as a set of catchwords. Now, the property of catchwords is each catchword occurs more frequently in that topic than others. It's not exclusive to that topic, like an anchor word, but it occurs with twice the frequency in that topic compared to the other, other uh, topics. 
And furthermore, it's not a single word that's a catchword. So for sports, it might not be just batter, it might be batter, run, bases, whatever, ball, so on. They need to have high frequency, but only together. So uh, the assertion now will be every 20th word is one of these four or five words, rather than a single word. Yeah? So is it critical that they have uh, like frequency twice that as other topics? OK, in the paper, we assume 1.2 times maybe. But I mean, some constant is in the theory. Empirically, 1.2 is justified. We'll see empirical justification. But it, it can't just be like strictly more. It has to be like one plus some epsilon. It, uh, yeah, I don't know how to use theoretically something that says just strictly more. Okay. But I need a factor higher than one okay. to use it. Is there another question? or no? OK, so there are two main assumptions. Catch words, which are, if you will, dominant words, right? Words or features, documents or vectors, words or features. It's a dominant feature is the first assumption. But we also assume dominant topic. And uh, this says that each document has one topic which is dominant. Namely, it has a weight of at least some alpha. Alpha, think of it as 0.4. That actually empirically is sustained. Whereas non-dominant topics all have weight, each at most beta, which is 0.3. So if I put 0.3 and 0.4 here, it turns out that is empirically justified, but not in each document. This is a bit stronger than we would like. It, it should be nicer to relax it to most documents, which likely will be possible with our techniques. But here, we, I assume, each document. Right? Beta is less than alpha? Beta is less than alpha. Yeah, I should have said, yeah. So beta is less than alpha, right. So 0.4, alpha is 0.4, let's say, and beta is 0.3. Okay, so these are the two main assumptions that we'll make. Uh, there's one other assumption. Sorry, one and a half other assumptions. We also assume that every topic has a very small fraction of documents which are almost completely pure. One minus delta of the weight is in that topic. Okay. This turns out also to be justified. This is not an assumption that says every topic, every document is pure. It's saying that a small fraction are pure. Okay. And this, I'm sorry, this is the last one. This is the half assumption in some sense. Um, and it's also intuitive. So for every word, we plot the number of documents versus the number of occurrences of the word. Okay, we plot a curve. Okay. That curve, we assume, has no local men. Why is this justified? I mean, empirically, yes. But why is it theoretically or intuitively justified? Now. Most uh, in this domain, most of the time, you assume that the this curve obeys Ziff's law, which is some power law, but monotonically falling, right? The number of documents in which a word occurs 100 times is going to be much smaller than the number of documents in which a So if it's a power law, then indeed it doesn't have a local min. It's falling all the time. But we don't expect the power law fall for catchwords. For catchwords, we expect that they occur with, uh, there's a unimodal. So the number of documents in which they occur 10 times is max, perhaps. So from 1 to 10, it goes up and then goes down. But no local min still. And it turns out, empirically, these are the only two behaviors that seem to exhibit themselves mainly. So this assumption is also satisfied empirically. Yeah? Well, wouldn't you have, like, well, it seems like you should have documents where the word only occurs once, or oh, sorry, like, you, you've got some. Uh, like maybe one or two documents in which like a word occurs a hundred times and like maybe non word occurs a hundred and one and then like another one word occurs two hundred times or something. Okay, so that potentially might happen if they are on different topics. Okay. So this is condition on condition on the topic I said in brackets, right? So once I tell you what the dominant topic is, we assume that that does not happen. Okay? That it is it is not uh, there's no local men between hundred and hundred and two. OK, so these are, uh, now these are all the assumptions. Of these, I would say the first two are the main ones. Uh, nearly pure. Uh, it turns out that with some, it, it, this is more or less necessary for what's called identifiability in, in a sort of vague way, but it's, it's necessary for identifiability for L1 error. The last one is, uh, it is an assumption, certainly, but, you know, but as I said, perhaps uh, the one important thing would be to remove the each and replace it by most, which 
Make. I feel like no local min you might almost be able to prove from your other assumptions, maybe if you made slightly stronger versions of them. Actually, uh, you, you're right. I mean, I have a vague suspicion that this assumption need not be made. It could be implied by the others, but I don't have a proof. So at the moment, we're making it. OK, and the algorithm is also going to be pretty simple. Uh, and I'll describe the algorithm and a bit of the proof. The proof is not necessarily that simple, but I'll describe a little bit. So S is, let's say, the number of documents. S for sample size, because this is the sample number of samples. For this talk, let's pretend that each, uh, the probability that each topic is dominant is 1 over k. That doesn't have to be. In fact, one of the uses of this will be when there's a rare topic uh, where its dominance probability is much lower. But let's pretend for this talk they're all equally dominant. Right? And here is the algorithm. It is going to use thresholding as the first important step. But uh, the threshold, unlike the toy case, the threshold is not the same for all words. It's going to be different for each word, and we are not given the threshold. We have to compute it. So it turns out the correct threshold without a proof, I'll tell you the correct threshold for each word is the first gap as we come from the top. As we come from high frequencies, take the maximum zeta, zeta is a frequency, so that the number of occurrences greater than zeta in a substantial number of documents, and the number of occurrences equals zeta happens only in a small number of documents. So there is a gap. So pretend this was zero, sorry, pretend this was zero, that no document had zeta as a frequency. And pretend that substantial number of documents have higher than zeta as a frequency, then there's a gap at zeta. Right? More than zeta, there are a lot of documents, suddenly there's none. The first such gap we observe turns out to be the correct threshold, turns out to be a threshold by which you can prove things, prove theorems. So that's how a threshold is found. Yeah. Um, now, the thresholding is also a little more complicated. It's not going to be 0, 1. It's a weighted version. And I won't tell you the weight, but it's a weighted version. But the main next step, the first main step is thresholding. The second main step is singular value decomposition. So you do singular value decomposition on the thresholded matrix, and that gets you starting centers for the k-means algorithm. So I'm going to use um, I'm going to use SVD to project down to a lower dimensional space and get clustering done in that lower dimensional space. Those are going to serve as starting centers for my k-means algorithm, which I'm going to run in the big space. Okay? K-means, we run k-means and in, in, the, in the whole space, starting with the centers, and we will show that this identifies the dominant topic. So at the end of that k-means algorithm, we'll have identified, not in every document, in most documents, what the dominant topic is. Okay? So it's, it's done clustering with respect to the dominant to topic. Now that's not enough. Um, and I'll show you a picture in the next slide why it's not enough. You still have to identify the catchwords. So now I know the dominant topic. I find the set of high frequency words in each cluster, in each dominant topic. And we'll be able to prove that that is a set of catchwords approximately for the topic. So this process now has identified the catchwords. Then we identify the nearly pure documents as the set of documents with the highest total number of occurrences of the catchwords highest frequency of catchwords. Okay. Those are nearly pure, and then their average will be roughly the topic vectors we seek. But uh, some picture is, is in order. So here was our original picture. What the clustering did was identify that guy, that, that, that portion here, the top portion, as all the documents with dominant topic one. Right? Identify that. But notice that unlike normal clustering, if I just take the center or the average of those circles, I'm nowhere near the corner. I'm somewhere in the middle here. Okay, that's no good, right? The center doesn't do me enough. Uh, any, any, uh, doesn't solve the problem. So that's why I have to go through the process of finding catchwords among these and so on and so forth. And then at the end of the process, I identify the nearly pure documents, the things nearest the vertex, that, that vertex. And then I take their average. That's not quite the vertex. I mean, these, in general, these points are all going to be inside or very close to the simplex. Their average will not be the vertex, right? But their average will be close enough to the vertex. That's what we'll prove. Okay. Now, 
Um, I want to run over uh, uh, the, um, the proof uh, in, a, in a slide or so, uh, in a slide or two. Uh, first, the properties of thresholding. Uh, perhaps instead of this, I'll show you a picture which makes it clear why thresholding helps. Sorry, uh, I guess, yeah. It's one of these other pictures. I can. Nope. That's uh, somebody else's talk. Or maybe it's this one. No. Just looking at Costas' thesis. Yeah, I, I shouldn't disclose the thesis before the defense, right? Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Um, So maybe it's all right. Yeah, okay. uh, so it's threshold or? Uh, yeah, that's the one, right. Yeah, okay. that's full screen. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, I see, right? small. But it's all right, actually. I think, um, um, I, the, the, yeah, this is the picture I want. So this is the data matrix A where I've rearranged rows and columns so that the dominant topics and dominant words are paired. Uh, it, it would be nice to have it be block diagonal. So these are the non-catch words. So this is typical, this is a real corpus. Non-catch words occupy quite a bit and that's black. There's no distinct, distinct, distinction features. They occur, they sort of occur in all the topics. But these first few things are the catch words for the first topic, second few things for the second topic. So if you notice, I would like it to be block diagonal, but there's a lot of, lot of stuff off diagonal, right? That's a, uh, that's a original matrix. I'm sorry, that's a thresholded matrix. Just a, a one, a B matrix, okay. But the original matrix is this, okay? Where there's a lot more gray, a lot more uh, ink off diagonal, right? So the thresholding buys you this. Yeah. The bottom blue stripe actually is a good question. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is only a picture, right? I mean, I'm uh, um, not quite familiar. But anyway, so this is what thresholding can buy you. Well, let's go to, uh, OK, good. So I go to Stanford. Good. Sorry? Full screen. Ah, oh, okay, good. Uh, sorry, view, right? Oh, control L is full screen. Command L. Oh, command L. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. So, properties of thresholding. Um, it turns out using the no local min assumption we can show that no threshold splits any dom dominant topic in the middle. So I don't end up making half uh, the documents in the topic threshold up and half threshold down. I never do that, right? Turns out that's true for every word, catch word or not. That only uses a lo no local min. You can sort of imagine that, right? We are finding the first gap. Gap is a min, and so I won't cut up any topic, right? There's no local min in the middle of a topic. So the thresholding gets you a block matrix for catch words, but for non-catch words, it can be high on several topics. It's that black black blob. Right? Uh, picture on the board, okay. So, oh, I had a picture already, so I don't have an excuse from this. Yeah. Are we done, right? Now, we are not yet done because we need intercluster separation still to be higher than intracluster spread. Now, thresholding helped in this, but it doesn't ensure this. That is, we need to know that between two clusters, there's a larger gap than the spread inside a cluster. Okay. Now here there is a, uh, uh, there is a problem, which is that I have to compare intercluster separation to the intracluster spread, not in the whole space, because that turns out this is not true, and I will give you an example in a minute. Um, well, maybe I should give you this example. So uh, I didn't draw the picture of the example. So think of the following two Gaussians in these D dimensions, spherical Gaussians um, of unit standard deviation, right? And centers apart by 100 standard deviations, 100 units. 
Okay, the, the spheres look like this. They really have a lot of geometric overlap because they're only 100 units apart to the center. The radius is root d, right? Root d is much larger than this, okay? It turns out they don't meet this condition, right? It's not true that intercluster separation. The intercluster spread is only 100, but the intercluster spread is root d. Okay, root d is much larger than 100. So you cannot cluster these two Gaussians by k-means, for instance. You can, but k-means will not give you the correct clustering, right? Now, however, these have the property that the variance as a measure of spread is small. Variance of this is small. So if you project them down, as we often do in mixtures, if you project them down to the SVD subspace, then they are nicely behaved, not before the projection, right? So it turns out that's uh, important, so that's why we do the projection, okay? Now, catchwords provide uh, substantial intercluster separation because catchwords are one topic or different catchwords of other topics, so they are quite separate, right? That, that satisfies this thing being big, but this, again, is, is what I said. Uh, this is the Gaussian example you have to be careful about. Inside cluster variance is bounded from machinery, so here you have to use random matrix theory because it's the singular values of the random matrix that we are concerned with. It's not true that the Frobenius norm is bounded. That's what uh, k-means would have you do in the whole space. That doesn't work. But in fact, the spectral norm is bounded, and that appeals to random matrix theory. Uh, and there, by now, we have extremely good results from random matrix theory that give you the right bounds here. And then uh, we, uh, well, there's a paper I had in Fox with Kumar about three or four years back, which shows that under this kind of separation, as we first project and find the centers to start k-means and then k-means works, gives you the correct clustering. Okay? That um, requires quite a bit of work to prove, but that's already known. So, okay, that gives you the correct clusters. Perhaps this is all I will say about the algorithm. Um, what is that? So I think I already drew these pictures, right? I already drew the picture of the simplex and so on and so forth. Now I'll show you the experimental results. Um, thanks, Tim. Yeah. So this is a different file, right? Yeah, that's a third file, yeah. The, this presentation, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So we tested it. I'm not an expert on the empirical stuff, but uh, my cohort is very good. But uh, so there are, uh, we tested it on four uh, corpora, right? One was SNPs, so many papers, um, and so on. You can read it. Random subset of 30,000 documents, random subset, and so on. Uh, 20, this is 20 news groups, so many topics. So here there are 20 topics. The rest, I think, all had 50 topics, OK? Um, now, the corpora in which we actually ran the test are semi-synthetic. We take the real corpus, fit an LDA model, and then generate from that model. That's how these tests are done. Um, and here are the empirical, oh, this is a check of the assumptions. Not yet the results, this is a check of the assumptions. I think it's sort of important to get the assumptions to be reasonable. And it turns out uh, we have empirical evidence of our assumptions, which is sort of nice that they actually work. So um, the K is a number of topics, 50, 50, and 20 in this case. This is a fraction of documents which have dominant, which um, fraction of documents have dominant topics, right? Uh, yeah. Sorry, so the setup again. So you take all of your documents, um, you fit a LDA model, right. and then you generate, and then you just regard these things. And then I throw the real corpus and, yeah. Throw it out and then you like pretend to synthesize documents going through. Right. So the LDA is a yeah. real stochastic model and you generate from that. That's how the experiments are done in Aurora et al. also. Because yeah. uh, we don't otherwise have a big corpus in which we know the topic vectors, right? That's the problem. See, it's a, that's a nice problem also, right? So given that LDA posterior computation is NP hard, it would be nice to solve the following problem, I give you a bunch of models, bunch of possible topic vectors, figure out which is the best, or attach a score to it, which is computationally efficient, which I can compute in polynomial time, which I don't know how to do that. Or oh, nobody knows how to do that. 
Okay, so uh, when we put alpha equals 0.4 and beta equals 0.3, I didn't say what beta is, but this majority of the documents do satisfy dominance topic, but not all the documents, right? So that's, that's important. So I think our proofs will probably work for a good fraction, a fraction of documents satisfying dominant topic, but we haven't done that. So this is that. Okay. And then the other big assumption is catchwords. Catchwords do exist. Um, uh, rho is the one point one is the gap between frequency uh, of uh, catchwords in their own topic versus other topics, and uh, lots of topics of dominant topics. I mean catchwords, this number of them. Uh, it's not true of anchor words. It turns out I, I don't have a picture of that. Do you know how, how big these sets of catchwords are? Are they like in the hundreds? They are in, no. They are in the twenties and thirties. So. That is, if you, if you define a catchword as something that occurs at probably at least one point, uh, frequency at least 1.1 1 .1 times, yeah, then it's about 20s and 30s. And that captures, what's the what's epsilon? Ah, that captures 0.25 of the frequency. Oh, okay. 0.25% or 25 uh, 25%. So, but it's not a majority, it's, uh, you know, so some fraction, order. good fraction. It's a small number of words. To get that. Yeah. Except the fact that there are three-fourths non-catchwords makes life a bit difficult. It would be awfully nice if 90% are just catchwords, because they'll be discharged. But yeah, so the, yeah. Yeah, you had a question? Oh, I also wanted to ask that. Oh, that one, okay. Okay, so this is a description of the procedure, right? So we generate a semi-synthetic corpus from LDA model trained by MCMC, right, Monte Carlo Markov chain, to ensure that the synthetic corpora retain the characters of real data. Uh, gives, so this is, um, I mean, you can, you can read that. That's how, well, if you're familiar with LDA, but otherwise it doesn't matter. It's symmetric LDA. We take the same hyperparameter for all topics. And the hyperparameter we chose is 0.01. It's 1 over 2K. Uh, the synthetic LDA is not guaranteed to satisfy the dominant topic assumption. The assumptions are verified on real corpora, right? These assumptions are verified on real corpora. Okay. So uh, we are not saying the synthetic document satis synthetic corpus satisfies our assumptions, but we still check them against the result, right? And gives good result, but doesn't mean that they just satisfy the assumptions. So I, I didn't follow that. You said the the assumptions were checked against which? The assumptions are che assumptions are checked in real corpus, right? So you take a real corpus, uh, do an LDA fit, and then take topic weights by computing something which is a proxy for the posterior. It's called uh, complexity or, or perplexity. It's called perplexity, which is a, so it's a very perplexing thing which, which they define, which is some, but, but use that to define, to say that this document has this proportion of this topic, this and this, and then see if they have a dominant this topic. real document. Those are real documents, real corpora. And then see if they have a dominant topic or not. Okay. And is it? The Aurora assumption, the anchor word assumption is not, I, I don't, so I have, okay, in the paper we have slides that tell you what the, the normal uh, topic modeling paper has these words that you generated for each topic. Unfortunately, I didn't put a slide. But Aurora's paper does not, the, the empirical evidence for anchor words is slim. I mean, it depends on how you said epsilon. Yeah, it depends on how you said epsilon. Depends on, so, so the point is, if you set the frequency requirement on the anchor word to be very low, you'll get them, right? But uh, the point is the running time depends, at least theoretically, on one of the sixth power of the frequency. So, so, so it'd be a little careful, but yeah, subject to that, they don't quite exist. So I, I, uh, I th let's see, this is, ah, these are the results. Then I have some pictures of the results. Now what happens here? So there is one uh, corpus on which we do worse. So the minus means we do worse than the Aurora I think this, both of these are Aurora et al. paper, right? And this is their better version. KL is kubelik level distance. It really is not KL, but that's what they call it. They also measure L1 error, right, overall. Their theoretical result is not for L1 error, but they measure the L1 error in the empirical things, which we also do. That's the same. Uh, so in this, we are slightly worse, but other things we seem to be, you know, substantially better. So this is how much, this is the L1 error, what does it say? Ah, average improvement, I think that's the average of all these numbers is 20%. Um, this is the L1 reconstruction error. So 
We did LDA, so we know the topic vectors, and we go run our algorithm or our OS algorithm, find topic vectors, and find the L1 error. That's what's, that's what's given here. Okay, so that's uh, these numbers. Okay, so we can, okay, so this is probably a better plot. In the sense, we were puzzled for a long time about how our errors came about. It turns out we, make, we have real outliers on which we make a lot of error, L1 error, and that penalizes us because the last picture, this is for the average L1 error over all 50 topics, okay? But uh, in general, though, for instance, so here's a plot, right, on the NIPS corpus, right? Blue is us, so for instance, uh, 40 of 50 topics, the error is less than 0 0.075 or something like that. But there's one topic on which 1.05, or two topics maybe, on which 1.0y. L1 error can go up to two because I'm taking the L1 difference between two probability vectors, so it can be greater than one. So that 1.05 is very bad, so is that there, so is it here, these are outliers. But you see otherwise, in, on, on most topics it seems to do well. I may, oh, I have some, this is perplexity, you know, I don't know what, uh, perplexity is a substitute for, uh, perplexity seems about even, perhaps Aurora is slightly better on this, on perplexity, but they're about comparable. I think that's all I have. Do you have any insight onto these topics you're getting badly wrong? Yeah, so I, uh, no, I mean, one conjecture question is, are they very rare? And the answer seems to be no, they are not rare. We actually do well. So there's a theory question. Can we probably do well on rare topics? And the answer is we are working on it, but it seems to be yes, the algorithm can do. So I don't know why it is that on those one or two topics it does really badly. So obviously if you subtract that, then the error will be small, but that's cheating. Yeah. So are these things where the, the means So the initialization of the k-means seem to be a big problem. So um, in the sense that you can get completely wrong if the initializations are wrong. But in these outliers, that's what's going on? It's, it's in that step? That could be. I don't think we know for sure whether it's going on or not. We do know, in fact, in the beginning, when we run the initial k-means, so the initial k-means, you project down to the 50-dimensional space and run k-means there. We don't do it exhaustively. That's still expensive. So we do an approximate version. It turns out we had to take the best of 10 runs in the beginning to get the right results. I mean, now we run Birch and it works, and it, you know, but, but the starting is, all k-means algorithms are really finicky about the start. They can go awfully wrong with a bad start, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, so for instance, you know, this green peak is before that. That, that one is one where there's no outlier, yes. <laughs> but uh, they have an outlier there, right? Yeah. The green, yeah, that's right. Any other questions or, let's see, I, oh yeah, I didn't finish indecently early, right? No, this is, this is not bad, yeah. So, thanks.